This is the IFF TV podcast. Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. This is our League of Ireland show and I'm back with a bang with Gary Spain. It's been a while since we have done our League of Ireland shows, which is normally myself and yourself. We've done a couple with Paul Tierney. A lot has happened um, in that time. Uh, I'm going to say the last one we did was just before the, the halfway break. Um, and in that process, the transfer market has uh, has opened up and it's really kind of, um, how would you say, taken an effect with a lot of League of Ireland clubs. We've lost a lot of young talent coming through and some of our best up-and-coming talent to a lot of League One clubs in particular. And um, if you kind of look at it, I understand our league is supposed to be a league that's you know there to develop players and they're supposed to go on to to bigger and better things. But I'm not so sure that League One <clears throat> is uh, is the be all and end all. Um, I'm just gonna have the the Kenny's kids uh, transfer centre just open up here just to kind of go through at least some of the players that have gone to um, to League One. I mean you've got. You know, uh, Dan Mandreo, who is one of the best players in the league. Darren Burns, one of the best upcoming players in the league. Same as Dawson DeVoy. Promise Amosher has gone to Fleetwood Town. Um, who else have you got? You've got... Um, Ed McGinty's gone to Oxford, you know. So. Ed McGinty, yeah. He just went last week as well um, after his heroics for Sligo in Europe. Uh, and there's, there's, there's other players there. Um, I know... Trent Coney Doherty's gone to Liverpool, but he never really was was that much playing with them um, with Derry. Uh, but there's there's more players there. I just can't see them off the top of of, of the list. But you get me. What I mean is like Dawson Devoy gone, Promise gone, Dara Burns, um, Andy Lyons linked heavily with a move to Blackpool. That doesn't seem like it's going to happen. That Shamrock Rovers seem like the only club are kind of standing up to it and kind of rejecting a few bids whereas other clubs in, in the league they're they're probably that much stretched from COVID and stuff like that that they probably just feel like they have to um basically take the the money and I think the respect the West the best wishes of the players now I don't know if too many players are forced to moves or whatever I haven't heard that but I just know that um the clubs really didn't get looked after there money wise and um yeah We've we've lost a good chunk of very good players that would be playing in the league otherwise. Yeah, I mean, there's pros and cons to it. As you said, we we the league has got a lot younger, and there's got a lot more talent in the league, and that's that's actually great great to see. And it's not necessarily a bad thing when we see our best young players going across the water. The really the thing that grinds my gears and gets to me is when they're going so cheaply, and uh, that's some of the best talent. And I mean, when I hear a five figure sum, I mean, that's between ten thousand and ninety nine thousand euro, and and probably closer to the ten thousand in a lot of cases. And it, it, that just to me is absolutely ridiculous, and and that's what really hurts. And I mean, the fee talked about for Danny Mandrew, as you said, was I think it was something like 30,000. Ed McGinty going for a five figure sum. He was the hero for Sligo. In they probably would, they would, well, they definitely wouldn't have got to play Motherwell if it wasn't for him. And he's gone to Oxford for for what has to be a pittance. And uh, I know, Paul, you may, I mean, you're well familiar with Everton fans singing about signing Seamus Coleman. Uh, for what 60 grand or whatever it was yeah and i thought we'd moved on from those days i mean it, that's the real crux i mean look it's fantastic to see guys like gavin bazunu going and, and rovers will eventually make millions out of that and uh frankly i was delighted they hung tough with andy lines i don't know how happy the likes of andy lines etc and that is the balance for the clubs but our clubs are signing these players on, on, on good contracts, on good money. And they have to be, if the player is a real success, then they have to get compensated for that. Because if the player flops and they fail, they'll probably, I mean, they can be on a two or three year deal and they're sitting in the stands and the club will still have to pay them. So, you, you, I mean, it's it's a no-win situation for the clubs now. If, if someone like Danny Mandrew, who came 
it. And I know people might say he made the Rovers made a profit. They made a tiny profit, but he went to Rovers. He was great at Bowes. He was a real success at Rovers. That's why um, he players want to sign him. And uh, but I, I I think it was a case of a release clause in this case. But I don't think these release clauses should be in contracts then because you can't have it both ways. You can't sign a player on a really good contract and then give a very low release clause because the release clause only applies if they become really successful, they play really well. And I mean, Andy Lyons was brilliant last night for Rovers. And uh, of course, clubs like Blackpool, of course, I'm, I'm surprised more championship clubs aren't looking at him. And uh, But Rovers need to be compensated because they've invested in him and Bo's invested in him as well. I mean, I'm not going to get into a Rovers Bo's debate on this. He's been an excellent player in our league. And both those clubs have shown a lot of faith and uh, a lot of investment in him. And I haven't a clue what wages he's on, but I'm sure he's earning very good money for our league. Okay, he would do significantly better if he goes across the water to the championship. And you we got to accept that. And I've absolutely no problem with our players going across the water to these clubs and they will earn more money. They will, I suppose in some ways, many of these clubs are even historically bigger than even the likes of Shamrock Rovers, who are the biggest club in the country. Um, clubs like Blackpool have a, a storied history and uh, are still a championship club. And uh, although probably, uh, well, they would be expected to be in the lower end of the championship rather than the top end of the championship. But, um, well, Andy Lyons was playing in the Champions League last night instead of the championship, so who knows. But if he is to go, I, I, these clubs have got to got to really pay for him. Yeah, well, I think I think that's the thing that a lot of people are disappointed about. They don't mind the player going for the move. It's the money that the players are going for to the clubs. That's disappointing because... Ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to be able to develop more and more players in this league. We want to be able to also bring fans to games to watch these players. But when the players are getting shipped off for, for next to nothing, really, in reality, when you look at what other players are going for uh, in different leagues and stuff like that, it's just disappointing because if you can get players going for a decent fee, you can re reinvest that. Maybe not into players all the time, but you could reinvest that in facilities. You could re re reinvest that into academies. You can reinvest that into marketing. There's loads of different ways that you could do it. And I think, in fairness to, to Shamrock Rovers, like in the way they do their marketing and stuff like that, it's really good now. Um, their facilities are really good as well, and they kind of set the standard for for other clubs. But now they're in a good position um, to be able to to say no to clubs. And I think it's just because Pico Lopez got injured that I think that was the reason why. He, uh, Stephen Bradley and Shamrock Rovers didn't accept the bid for Andy Lyons as well. I'm not saying it wasn't because of the fee or whatever, but it, it that was, um, I think I read that online the other day that with Pico, uh, picking up a, a knock, that, that that was the reason why Andy Lyons is, um, but the, the other thing in the Andy Lyons one, I mean, I, I think Blackpool increased their bid by something like a hundred thousand. I'm only going by reports, and I appreciate I think it went up to three seven five in the end, or yeah, something yeah, like but that. It, they started off at something. Like two hundred thousand, yeah, or something. I mean, and and even then, that shows that still is very very small money to a championship club. I mean, you if you look at championship clubs and they'll spend millions buying players from Europe, and 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 I know you're sorry. Just let me back up because I fully agree with you on Shamrock Rovers, and they are very much the barometer, and they are uh, they do excellent mar marketing, and they're a very well run club. And uh, hats off to them on the Andy Lines one. Uh, I, I'm just looking at examples on the continent and take somebody like Malmo in Sweden. And, and they've gone, I, I'm not even saying this is the model Rovers are looking at, but Malmo have gone from a, 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 a policy of developing, working with young players, but with a view that they will be sold on. Now, the Swedish league is a long way ahead of our league at the moment, despite some of our fantastic results in Europe against them over the years. And they've got proper broadcast deals and everything like that. But Malmo are, well, they're currently in the Champions League. They're currently the, the champions. And, and they've won quite a few of the Swedish leagues in recent years. But when they sell players, generally, it's not even for six-figure sums. It's for seven-figure sums. And... Uh, 
and and that's I think where we need to be to be getting to. If we're develop, I mean, our clubs have had really good results in Europe. Uh, Shamrock Rovers, Sligo Rovers, and St Pat's have all really impressed, and uh, against players that are valued at millions. I mean, are you telling me if a championship club wanted to try and sign one of those Luda Goretz players last night? I don't think they'd even get them, but if they did, they'd be paying well for it. Yeah, I'd agree. But if you actually look at the players that went away, you'd make a pretty good League of Ireland 5 or so with the players that uh, that did leave, you know? You'd make a very good 11 a side team from the players that left. I actually saw someone on Twitter picked one and uh, it'd be good enough to challenge Shamrock Rovers. Yeah, well, that's that, well, that's it. But I, I, I'm total agreement with you there. And I think we've kind of seen a bit more of the Swedish league with Zach Bazzetti going over, you know, um, and the coverage that they get over there and stuff like that. And it's just they do things correctly. Whereas here, we just we don't have a clue what we're doing. Um, not necessarily us, but uh, the powers that be. Just in, in my opinion, they don't they don't have a clue in, in in how to get the best out of the league and how you can um, maximize the marketing and maximize you know capitalizing on on different things like trending things like i look at someone like aaron howie at cork city in my opinion if he was leading things there i think things would be would be up to a very very good level i think i look at the stuff he does with cork all the time and um in fairness he set a bit of a good standard within the league of ireland in terms of if you look at some of the funny content that they put out there it's actually very good now i'm not saying we, we're trying to be funny or anything like that but i think when you have someone who kind of knows the ways to be able to do things right in that sense um i think that people at the powers at b i'm going to keep calling them um should be looking at um hiring people like that who who love the league but also want the best for the league and, and want um because that's what ultimately where it all stems from if you can get the league right and if you can get the facilities right um and maybe the government may need to help out with that but if you can get all those things aligned and i don't think they ever have been aligned before um but if you can get those things aligned and, and maybe hone in on that and try get more investments in all clubs and then you generate an interest if you bring fans and we've always said it if you can bring fans and you can bring uh families to grounds and it's clean and you know and i only look at there's only a handful that you could say yeah i bring my family there or bring my kid like talga park isn't in great nick i'll admit that as a shells fan sitting here with a shells top on me now and i'll say that and it's not a great place to bring family but if you're going as adults it's fine but if you're gonna go somewhere as a family you'd probably and i think you've said this before as well Tallis stadium is your model um but then you look around there's other places like i look at wexford like where they have very carry park is really nice and it's a nice area but maybe the kind of out, outer line of the pitch needs to be worked on to be more kind of there for, for for fans and that to go to but uh treaty's decent enough i would say but again you it's, it's uh, probably need, the toilets the that feel, left out no yeah. the market's feel needs a lot of work still it's it's got a long way to go it's, yeah uh, well the majority of them do so like i'm not picking out any any like major flaws out of anyone like the dundalk have been the go-to team for a number of years and their ground is still getting complained about by every single away fan that travels there as well so this is like this is the problem it's the one club that you could probably say you go there it's clean um it's it's not you don't get that much hassle i know they've been in the in the uh, papers and all for the wrong reasons and reasons but you, you're always going to get one or two idiots anywhere you go i think anyway and that's just magnified when you're at the top of the table i, I think you get them at all clubs and it's, i think you'd you'd uh, agree with me on that but i think if you it's a place where you could bring your family if you've, you've brought you know your family to under 21 games there the women's games you know it's a, it's a good place to bring and go with your family it's a good day out you get good food there you get clean facilities you can go in you can wash your hands you can use the toilets and you're not going Ugh, looking at stuff can, growing on park, the wall you can park in the square you know there is yeah it, it's all it, it, there is a whole package there yeah well, I, that's I, I agree, in, I agree just... in the facilities yeah I, I think it also needs investment not just in facilities i think it needs sponsorship uh, 
I, I might go back to harp on a little bit about Sweden because I, I was actually on Monday, I was out in the, I don't think I'm breaking any confidences in this, but uh, I was representing Treaty United on a, an SLO training course out on Monday. At a, and a, one of the the SLO actually giving the course, she was the SLO for Jur Gardens or DIF in Sweden. But one of the things I picked up on that she mentioned about 10 years ago, uh, the Swedish Football Association got together with a bank, I think it was a large pharmaceutical industry, and the broadcasters, and uh, the one of the, the big TV companies. And between the four of them, there was an investment strategy for the clubs, and there was also things the clubs had to do. And it just struck me that, uh, I mean, a, co a country like Sweden, that's not that much bigger than ourselves, uh, population-wise. Okay, it's got a few million more. But, I mean, their football clubs, their bigger clubs are on probably a different level. And in some ways, it shouldn't be. I mean, I actually went to, when I was over in Gothenburg at the for the the, game, the women's game in April, I actually went to a top division game in Sweden. And now it was two of the smaller clubs. It was uh, BOIS from Varberg against Kalmar. And uh, now it was a very enjoyable day out. But stadium facilities were grand there was nothing wrong with them but it was nothing now they'd just come up admittedly from the second tier but there was um i mean it wasn't as good as tala in my book okay it's a lot better than some of the other grounds in the league and uh but i i don't see you and i appreciate the likes of aik dif north shopping malmo ifk gothenburg they're all on a different level facilities wise and budget wise and everything like that but i don't see why we can't aspire to that but we do need, I think, it's to get major sponsors involved in the league to get a proper broadcast deal. I mean, like they're getting in Sweden, like they get in Denmark, that there's actually money given to the clubs to broadcast the games on TV. And uh, I know some people were, were complaining about last night's uh, game not being on TV. But um, I don't know, maybe we're flogging a dead horse with RTE at the moment, but... I, maybe we should look at Sky or something like that. I, I, I think our summer football should be attractive to Sky. And uh, I don't know, maybe just thinking some thinking outside. No, the you're, you're, you're right. Yeah. I think Sky is actually a very good shout, like because they do the GAA, you know, there's plenty of football fans there. And it, just, it could be a chance to get a new audience there, you know, um, Sky Sports Watchers, you know, because. How many times have you sat there? Yeah, if you had you've had Sky Sports and there'd be teams like I don't know Benfica or something like that. Now I know Benfica are a very good side, so I'm not I'm not <laughs> comparing anything like that. But what I mean is, you'll just watch it because it's a game of football. Do you know what I mean? Uh, or you'll yeah. watch the A League or or MLS even. Um, there's there's games like that. Um, and sometimes the MLS they'll have the second string out or whatever, or there'd be two teams who don't have the star players playing. And you'll watch it because it's on. And I think that could be a good way to get fans on board. They've sponsored the, the women's team. So I don't see why. I, like, I, I understand why they probably wouldn't put women's national league games on because there's not, you know, uh, viewing figures. I wouldn't say that would be that big. Um, well, actually, TG, but, TG Cahar. Yeah, they did. Yeah, board, I, which is, I think that's actually great to see. And maybe it's better than well, nothing, you know. It, I, I think it's great. Um I suppose I, I don't think they'd pay the money. What I would like to see is our clubs actually getting money for our games live on TV, like they have. I mean, the Danish, the, the Danes have a fantastic deal. The Swedes have a, an incredible deal. And uh, most of the continental clubs uh, across the board, even in the, the so-called smaller leagues and the smaller market countries, are getting proper income from television because our clubs don't get that. They get probably zero income from TV. And uh, and not that much from sponsorship either. I mean, I don't see the – I don't want to – look, the big banks, the big pharmaceutical companies, the big software companies. There's so many big companies here, and you don't really see them associated with our clubs, and I'm just wondering why not. Mm. And, well, we uh, don't have a national team sponsor as well, so I think that – Well, that's another issue. That's another thing, yeah. You know, so I think I, – I agree with what you're saying. I can't understand why there's so many sponsors in GAA and rugby and all these other sports, but football seems to be the bad man sport here. I don't know, or soccer, if you want to call it that. But uh, 
it seems to be the bad man's port where I don't know, no one wants to go near it, no one wants to touch it, but it's a shame because the product will never grow unless it's backed. You know, and actually, sh- it is actually growing even this year. I mean, the crowds yeah. are up. There's there's new fans going to games. It, it can be hard to get tickets for a lot of games now. Um, I, I mean, I saw Shamrock Rovers were delighted. They were, they should be. We'd be three 0 down. They got over six thousand last night. And then I saw someone in Cork City tweeting out that they got uh, far, they got even more fans at a first division match against Galway a couple of weeks ago than than were in Tala for the Champions League last night. But in all cases, that those attendances are actually great to see, and uh, it is growing. But we also need to get sponsors on board. We need to have these games live in TV and hopefully the clubs earning an income for them being on TV. Yeah, exactly. Well, this this is this is where we're at. I suppose that kind of takes us into the next thing with, with European football and stuff like that. We know, look, that the game wasn't shown last night. You were at the game, the Shamrock Rovers game. Um, I think it just wasn't shown because they had the women's Euros on there, which is fair enough. Um, they they weren't going to know that the game was going to be put on the actual um, that time or whatever with with dates and stuff like that. Um, or some whatever way they do logistics, but it was time for another broadcast to step up there, and they didn't. So um, can't always be pigeonholing uh, RTE to be the ones that don't do it. I know LOI TV done a really good job um, in facilitating and making sure that went uh, went to plan, and and I watched it on that stream, and I thought it was very good. So um, people will bone. I'm not paying the seven euro, but I think the club get the seven euro in the end, so I didn't mind paying it. You know, it's like paying into a match, but you're obviously watching it. Yeah, I mean, I think these games should be on TV, and uh, and yeah, maybe it's a good point that it's not just RT. I mean, uh, Virgin or somebody else could have stepped up and and taken the game. Sky, 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 yeah. <laughs> But um, I actually noticed as well, I was just checking the, the Northern Ireland champions, Linfield, are a goal up uh, in Norway tonight. And that game isn't on TV anywhere either. You can buy the, you have to buy the stream for that as well. And uh, I don't know, I think these games, they should be live. Uh, I, don't, I don't see why they aren't uh, in some form or another. I appreciate maybe the semi-finals of the Women's Euros and the other semi-final is on tonight, so there was never going to be a good night. It had to be either last night or tonight, so there was always going to be a clash. But, um, yeah, I, th- I think they, they should be on TV. Now, maybe if it had been on TV, maybe there wouldn't have been over 6,000 in Tala last night as well. Uh, does the TV affect the attendance? That, that's another question, but I still think... Uh, these games should be on TV. Yeah, no, I agree. Now you look. We we we'll move off the topic of money and we'll move back onto the topic of football here. Um, look, the 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 Irish clubs have been doing well in Europe. Um, Sligo got a, a huge one uh, nil first leg victory over Motherwell last week in Motherwell, and they're going to be playing uh, them in the second leg, and hopefully they can beat them. Massive result, but it's it's only half time in the tie really. Um. Pat's got a really good 1-1 draw. I was at that game and they should have won that by about 3 or 4-1 in the first leg. I have to say they were very unlucky. Um, they really limited um, them to, to very little. Um, like Miura, Miura didn't have much to show. They they were gifted a goal. Uh, I was sitting beside you for the game. So, um, you know, we both saw he was gifted a goal. They had one chance then and uh, Pat's keeper made a great save from that. Otherwise, you, you'd comfortably say they... They could have won three, four, one. I, I agree. I think Pats should have won. Um, they, they had the chances, probably didn't take them. Uh, Chris Forrester played really, really well, and uh, very, very well worked goal. Great goal. He he could have scored a really fantastic goal with a great run. Just couldn't finish it at the end as well. Um, I do fear for them tomorrow night. I mean, if, if you look at the evidence. And hopefully I'll be wrong on this. If you look at the evidence of the 90 minutes, you'd say Pats have a great chance and probably should actually finish the job. But you often find these clubs, they're very different away from home and at home. And I wouldn't be surprised if Mura are a hell of a lot better uh, tomorrow night. I hope I'm wrong on this, but it could be a lot tougher 
for Pats. The one thing it is great to see all over social media is so many Pats fans making the the journey to was it Murska Sobota or something like that. I that's I think that's the the region in Slovenia where it is anyway, and uh, all sorts of planes, trains, and automobiles and going through about twelve different countries to get there. And a safe trip, lads. And I hope you have a and lasses. And I hope you have a fantastic time. And it is a really beautiful part of the world when you do get there. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, Pats can uh, can get through. And uh, that was it was a great performance. And uh, hopefully, they can finish the job. But I, I think it's going to be very, very tough tomorrow night. Uh, traditionally, the Slovenian league. Their clubs do outperform ours in Europe, and uh, the likes of Maribor, etc., Olympus against Dundalk and whatever else. Um, it's going to be it's going to be tough, but hopefully Pats can can do the job. Sligo, as you said, it was a fantastic win away to Motherwell. I was actually down at the Ballot Town game, and I think it's fair to say, and even the Sligo fans I was talking to afterwards. Sligo were very, very fortunate to get through. They did not play well at all. They had played well in Wales and, and won, the, won the game, and it looked like it was going to be a formality. And Bala were a very limited side. And uh, it was thanks to Ed McGinty, really, that Sligo got through. And then Sligo losing at home to UCD and being well beaten, I thought, I really feared for them going to Motherwell. But what a win, what a performance. And I really, really hope they can finish the job tomorrow night. Uh, it'll still be very tough at home, but uh, hopefully with the one goal advantage, they can they can do it. And uh, but maybe I mean, how much are they going to miss Ed McGinty tomorrow night? Could he be the difference? The five figure fee that he went for could he be the difference between Pats and another whatever two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand they'd make if they can actually finish the job tomorrow night? How much would that be worth to Sligo Rovers? Yeah, well, I think that's that's the stage to wrap. But I don't think they'd be looking further than the game itself. Look, if they can beat Motherwell, great. I think it would show that the, there's not that much difference between the the leagues, um, other than Celtic and Rangers. And um, yeah, look, I hope I hope Sligo and Pats go do the business and excel the next round. Um, I just saw there Shamrock Rovers have signed Simon Power. Um, he used to play with Norwich <clears throat> and I think he was at UCD before as well and he was at a couple of other clubs on loan and stuff but he has signed for Shamrock Rovers so that's a good signing for them I'd imagine he'll be eligible to play in Europe as well for the rest of their um, <clears throat> for the rest of their campaign there um, they'll be playing Scoopy of uh, North Macedonia you were at the game last night I watched it online Rovers were very very good but I think they were just lacking Someone who regularly scores goals. And I know Aaron Green scored a goal. But just someone who regularly scores that you could kind of look to. There was a period where they were brilliant in terms of possession and everything like that. But they just couldn't break through to get the couple of goals that they maybe deserved. And I'm not saying ludicrous are bad or anything like that. But they had them right at the back foot with the with the 10 men. I really thought uh, the, ga the game was there for the take. But they just... Couldn't score that that goal, and then ultimately when they did get the goal, they really went for. They got punished towards the end. Yeah, I don't mind. I, I, as you said, they got punished towards the end, but they were. That was in the ninety first minute. They were chasing chasing the game. There was five minutes of added time, so they had to take chances, and they were caught. But uh, well, Aaron Green was excellent. He was he was man of the match last night, and he did score, as you said. But I, I take your point about not having a prolific striker, and. Uh, between Aaron Green, Rory Gaffney, there isn't someone who's going to bang in 20 goals a season or whatever in, in, in this league. Um, but I don't want to take away from the performance last night because they were really excellent against uh, a much more fancied opposition side, a, a club like Ludogorets with a, a significantly higher budget than Shamrock Rovers, a club that's dominated the Bulgarian league in the last 11 years that are regularly playing the group stages, not, not just the conference or the Europa League, but in the Champions League as well. They've played in group, group stages a couple of times. And Rovers could have... Now they probably, ultimately, they did leave themselves too much to do, but they could have done it last night, and I think they'll take great confidence from the win. 
I think the crucial thing now is to go on and to beat Scoopy or however you pronounce it, as you say. Um, that's a very winnable tie. Our league is ranked well above North Macedonia. Uh, Shamrock Rovers coefficient is much higher than them. Now, by all accounts, they were really unfortunate against Dinamo Zagreb. They played really, really well over the two legs. But they also lost 2-0 to Lincoln Red Imps in the, the previous round. So um, it's a very winnable tie for Shamrock Rovers. It's by no means a gimme. It's going to be very tough. And the big thing is, if Rovers can win this, they're in the group stages of either the Europa League or the Europa Conference. If they lose this, this tie, they will have another chance in the conference. But I was looking at, there's five potential, well, there's more than five at the moment, but it will come down to five potential opponents. And if you're looking at some of the teams they could come up against, they could draw Lech Poznan, they could draw Cluj from Romania, they could draw the, the Kazakhstan or the Bosnian champions. So th this might actually be their best chance. I mean, if they can win this one, they stay in the Europa League and they have a free shot then at the Europa League group stages, lose them in the conference group stages. So I think this, these next two matches are going to be absolutely crucial and worth... I don't want to keep harping on about money, but they're probably worth a couple of million euro to Shamrock Rovers. And that would make such a difference to Rovers' budget. I know maybe some of the fans of the other clubs in the league might be not too happy with the, their biggest rivals um, getting two million. And maybe it's a bit easier for me as a fan of a first division club to wish Rovers well. I do wish all our clubs well in Europe, obviously. But um, I think these two matches could really decide and shape Shamrock Rovers' season. I mean, uh, certainly far more important than the FAI Cup tie at the weekend. I mean, if you offered Stephen Bradley going out of the FEI Cup and getting through against Scoopy, I'd say, or Scoopy, however it is, I'd say he'd take it because um, that would be massive for Shamrock Rovers if they can. It's a very winnable tie. Um, now, I'm sure that their opponents are going to be looking at this and saying it, it's very winnable for them as well with a massive, massive prize on offer. And uh, fingers crossed that they can do it. I think as well, though, the 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 carrot at the end of the stick there is obviously the European football and and the constant that is that that carries over. I think the buzz that creates, like you remember, even when Dundalk they weren't at their greatest and they had Filippo as their their manager, Giovanni, and uh, even the buzz that was around that, you know, even though it was during COVID, there was a great buzz around the fact that when Irish club were in um, the Europa League, it's seen as a bit like. Um, and the novelty because it doesn't always happen you know what i mean obviously we want it to, we want it to be a case where it's not a novelty and it's an every every year thing but um i'd love to see them get in and, and it means more european football more european football for us to co cover um as well you get to see different teams that you didn't probably think you would like i even remember when they played milan there a few years ago that was great you know what i mean there's just really good nights that are made out of it and it'd be really good nights for the fans if they can uh, get past scoopy now um as you say about the the fai cup i think they would put that to, to one side if that was the case or they might go out with a second string side you know um, players that maybe hadn't been playing but i think you got to look at the strength of the shamrock over side because if you look at it and we were at the pats game last week like Barry Cotter, other than Chris Forrester, was the best player on that pitch last week. And he hadn't played in eight weeks. And if Shamrock Rovers can let a player of his quality go, and I, it looked like the shackles were off for him. He just really looked to be enjoying himself. He was flying up and down that line until he couldn't anymore and he had to be taken off. But I think that goes to show that, that you know there is a lot of quality in that squad. They're after getting Simon Power now, so I wonder what that means for whoever. Um, is he replaced with for, for Danny Mandreau now? Um, that'll be interesting to find out where he plays because he's mainly just a like a winger, um, and he has some serious serious pace. His dad used to send me videos all the time of him just running uh, at players, and he's just frightening pace. So that could be something in Europe that may come to uh, come to their advantage. And like you say, I know people might get a bit annoyed with me being a Shells fan, but I do. I want to see all our um, League of Ireland clubs do well. Um, because we get to enjoy these these European nights as well. Ideally, one day I'd like to see shells in these European nights again, um, and get to witness that. But like, I'd be supporting all the clubs, um, in in Europe, 
and especially this week as well uh, and going forward uh, I always have just because I want to see our footballers on a stage and, and the league is so small and the, the country is so small you, you tend to know a lot of people like I would know Stephen Bradley you know or Tim Clancy or whatever and I have an actual personal relationship with them so I would like to see them do well based on the fact that I know them you want to see people you know do well um, and and obviously then there's players as well and there's players who've come on this this show and done stuff with us as well so you've got to take football rivalry out of it and, and realise that there's, there's definitely more to gain from an Irish perspective certain fans of certain clubs won't realise that but um yeah, that's that's there. Yeah, I, I, the, the way I look at it as well is, I mean, I, I appreciate if you look across the water, and uh, fans of Manchester United or Liverpool do not want to see their the other do well in Europe, and they take great delight when they lose, etc. But I, I think if you look at it more league, it's 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 a much smaller league, and I, I think if our clubs are doing well in Europe, it does lift the league as a whole, and. Uh, I love to see the likes of Shamrock Rovers up against Tottenham in group stage football, Dundalk up against Arsenal, etc. And uh, it shows, okay, they were beaten, but, uh, well, famously, uh, Rovers took the lead in White Hart Lane, etc. And, and the scenes from that were just incredible. I was only watching on TV. It must have been amazing to have been in the stadium for games like that. But um, it is great for our league and the, the prestige of our league. And hopefully, I don't want to go back and harp on about money, but bringing money into the league, maybe attracting sponsors into the league, etc. Uh, maybe attracting a proper TV deal, etc. So to actually see our clubs, and particularly, I, I go back to Dundalk a few years ago when not only they, they competed in the group stages, they actually took four points from the first two games. And uh, I, I was at the games, the, the brilliant win in Tala against Maccabi. And it was also at Senate St. Petersburg when if they, they really should have beaten them in Tala and could actually have beaten them in, in St. Petersburg as well. And uh, some brilliant performances there. And uh, that was, well, it was Stephen Kenny's Dundalk uh, competing with the very best in Europe. Yeah, but there's also like if Shamrock Rovers has to do well and be regular Europa League as well. And, and maybe if it's a case where tickets couldn't be sold to, to add more they might move it into the Aviva and stuff like that so there's, there's that possibility there as well um, they probably won't but if they did obviously with Dundalk and there was that you know and Bowes as well when they got into um, the games in the Aviva as well which was great because I know there was a limit of fans or whatever but th those days were great when when they were doing well and they were putting it up to the likes of Pauk and stuff like that and they'd you know Famous games in their history, but uh, Bows were brilliant, and, yeah. That was a brilliant yeah. run for them, yeah. Brilliant atmosphere, even with limited attendance in the Aviva. It was, it was fantastic. Um, mm. I don't know if Shamrock Rovers would go there now if they were to stay in the Europa League. And I'm getting ahead of myself here and getting to the group stages, they have the potential to draw a Manchester United or an Arsenal, and I think the pressure would be phenomenal then for them to bring the game to the Aviva, but. I'm not sure. Do you really want to go to the Aviva Stadium with 50,000 people and 40,000 plus shouting for Manchester United against Shamrock Rovers? Yeah, well, sure. Look, didn't the dock play Arsenal before anyway? Um, and they, they only brought over a second string team, really. But anyway, um, yeah, look, as you say, these European nights are great and you get to see um, different players like Kagawa was playing for <clears throat> Pauk that night, you know what I mean? And I remember Keith Buckley didn't give him a sniff. So it's just cool to see those types of things, you know what I mean? So that's why I, I love um, seeing our clubs doing well in Europe. Um, and as I said, that run with Dundalk, I was away in Canada at the time and I remember there was people talking from Canada about, you know, Dundalk, as they called them then. Um, I remember coming back from, from actually playing a match because we would have played in in evening times over there and we'd come back and you'd see Dundalk were doing well. Um, and they were showing the highlights of the Europa League and stuff like that. And this is in Canada and then this Canadian guy is going, who's that team, Dundalk, blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? It creates a buzz and a bit of a hype and uh, that's what we need and we need, we need that more regularly. But uh, yeah. yeah, speaking of that actually, Paul, I was just watching some of the YouTubers and some of the comments on social media, people coming in from Germany, from England, uh, Scotland actually, it's some of the videos, guys at the Cork and Galway match and Turner's Cross, etc. cetera, uh, guys at Rovers Bowes, and uh, some fantastic comments and really positive stuff around our league. 
and it's great to see from abroad and then maybe that doesn't transfer at home when it comes to things like sponsorship tv coverage etc and maybe even just coverage of the league in general well i think you know from even this channel you know how hard we've tried to get sponsorship over the years and nothing it's like there just doesn't seem to be any interest in trying to help or, or grow or or anything like that and i uh, you know i would say we've we've got some really good guests on the podcast and uh, you know aaron Connolly only recently and, and that's obviously done the rounds gavin bazunu and these were the first interviews that they did since they left uh their their old clubs you know to sign for their new ones and still we get them on the regular and, and still people for some reason don't want to, to jump on that as well so i think it's the same with the league it's just it's just seen as something that sponsors just don't want to touch for some well, strange I, I, reason. I wonder, is it something, I mean, is it just a branding or a marketing or something around Irish football? Is As you mentioned with the league, maybe even the national team not having a sponsor as well. Uh, maybe just something like the image. Uh, I don't know, maybe just a branding, the whole thing needs to change or something uh, because there's just... I don't know too much negativity or something. It's seen. It's not seen as something that sponsors want to get uh, associated with or something like that. Um, I don't know. Mm. Maybe there's, there's well, I think something in that. It's not seen as glamorous, um, but I think at the moment women's football is very, very popular in terms of um, you know the national team and all. They're doing well like that. So I think it's seen as you know with Sky and stuff like that. That that's something that you can get behind. It's a very positive story and stuff like that. Whereas you look at the League of Ireland, as you say, maybe the grounds don't look as well or or anything like that. Or maybe it's the fact that there seem to be hooligans or whatever that sponsors maybe don't want to get involved from that side of things. That's what I think it may be because, as I said, the women's team have a sponsor. The men's team don't. I just find that a bit odd. Why wouldn't you sponsor both? But that's just that's just my, my two cents. Yeah, and it, it, Cadbury's are actually not just Sky. You have Cadbury's on board for the women as well. And uh, I was looking this morning. Uh, the the Finland game looks like, unless it's a Ticketmaster screw up, I uh, haven't heard final confirmation. But it's been impossible to even buy a single ticket for the Finland game after a few minutes after they went on sale at ten o'clock. And well. Sorry for those of you who can't get tickets, but I think it's absolutely fantastic to see if it is a total sellout with massive demand. And uh, yeah, th there's probably something to that in that the the women, well, the women's national team are doing incredibly well, which is great to see. And it is great to see that sponsors... Mm, and, and, and I'm not taking away from any of that either, by the way. I love watching them. I think they're great. And I, I think they're all brilliant ambassadors for what they do. So um, I'm, I'm not taking anything away from that. What I'm just saying is it's seen at the moment that the women's sport is on the rise and it's something to get behind. Whereas the League of Ireland has never really been seen to any... Like even our own um, association has never gotten behind it. Do you know what I mean? In previous years. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, look, I, I, I think it's great that the women, that, that the, the, the national team, they are on the rise. They're doing really well, and hopefully, they'll get at least a playoff, if not qualify for the World Cup. And uh, and it is great to see brands like Sky and Cadbury's, I mean, global, major global brands, want to associate with our women's national team. And that look, and there's that is just fantastic, and. But it's also valid and to ask the question, well, why don't brands like Sky and Cadbury's get associated with, with our league and, and with the well with the men's national team as well? Um, who are also, I know we're not with this is the League of Ireland show, but they are also potentially on the rise, maybe not doing quite as well as the women at the moment, uh, but also potentially doing well and hopefully qualifying for the next Euros. And because uh, I, I, I mean, and going back to the league, I really enjoyed last night in Tala. Uh, okay, as a neutral, I obviously I wanted Rovers to win, but as a non Rovers fan, and I know there were plenty of other fans of other League of Ireland clubs there last night as well. And it was a fantastic night, it was a brilliant atmosphere, and uh, Rovers played really well, and that was. Last night was a great product. It was great to see so many kids there, so many families there, etc. I'm sure they all had a fantastic time. And 
to me, it's strange that some of the brands don't want to get involved in that. Now, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's some of the unsavory incidents. I know there were some bottles thrown, etc. I mean, and, and that can be shooting from a, an Irish football perspective, shooting ourselves in the foot, the people who do that. And I don't know if we can keep those out of the game. But apart from that, it was a, a fantastic atmosphere in a fantastic stadium. And uh, it's a great product. And we can see people coming in from Germany, from England, and raving about our league. And the whole kind of, I don't know, there's an authentic, an authenticity around it with the atmosphere, the local passion for football that's there. And uh, if you take the likes of Sligo Rovers tomorrow night, it's impossible to get a ticket for the showgrounds. It's going to be absolutely rocking. And... Uh, how come there isn't more companies and brands like like the Sky and Cadbury getting involved in our league? Yeah, and I don't think what you're saying is like you're not just singling out them. Like fair play to them for what they're doing, but it's just kind of we want more big brands like that trying to get involved within our own um, Irish football league setup. Is more. Was more what you mean. So just in case anyone's yeah, listening, and, and we should. Just... And sorry, I should actually mention SSC or Tricity, of course, who do sponsor the league. And yeah, I'm sure all the clubs and we're really grateful for their sponsorship. But um, I, I just mean in general, getting mean major brands being sponsoring our big clubs, and uh, I, I mean some of that used to happen happen in the past. I mean, I don't want to get any of these wrong now, but I remember things like Guinness being in the front of. Uh, it was Cork City's jersey, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and some of the other uh, Julux being in the front of the the shells, shorts, etc. Yeah. Et uh, paints, yeah. Um, it was, was it Porus whiskey was in the front of uh, Rovers and things like that. Probably, um, probably a few more. I mean, I know in, in Limerick, uh, Wang and Glo- at the time Dell actually as well. Uh, both major software companies, uh, major sorry Dell computer company, but major computer companies. Um, we're on the front of the, the Limerick short over the years, and uh, you don't seem to see major brands or someone's going to dive in and say, what about so-and-so? But uh, it would be nice to see the major brands associated with our clubs. And maybe I'll go back to the Sweden example where you see things like Swedbank, et cetera, uh, the big banks, Unibank or whatever in Denmark being on the front of shorts and, and stuff like that. Um why doesn't that happen here? It, they're all absolutely valid questions, um, and we'll probably keep on talking about it. I wasn't expecting to go this long on that subject, but I'm glad we did because we've, we've touched all bases with it. But I want to get back to just uh, the league itself. Obviously, we had a few games over uh, the weekend and stuff like that. Um, I'll start with the Premier Division. we finish with the first division. Um, Shells 2-0 victory over... Um, UCD, Sean Boyd and Dan Carr with the goals. I was at that game. I'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, Dundalk 3-0 win over Finn Harris, Dara Lee, Keith Ward and Stephen Bradley with the goals there. And then at the weekend, it was Shamrock Rovers 1 draw that United won with the uh, Evan Weir getting a late um, equaliser after Idemo Maku, who scored as well last uh, last night, sorry, late um, was the goal scorer again for Shamrock Rovers and Evan Weir got a second yellow in uh, late in the game. So, um, yeah, just uh, going to get the table up first. Um, and then, yeah, so Shamrock Rovers still top there, played 24 on 52 points, Dundalk on 20, uh, 24 games on 45, and then two points below them with a game in hand is Derry City, and then Pats are on 36 points, while there we are on 43 so there's a big gap from the top three downwards there's even a bit of a gap from Shamrock Rovers um, in, uh, to second place which maybe if they progress in Europe that might be um, that might be bridged but we, that's that remains to be seen but just on um, Shells on, on Friday against UCD it was I'd probably say it's far to say i go as far as to say that the first half was one of the worst first halves I've ever seen from both sides just it was like a game of chess it was like nobody wanted to make a mistake both sides were te- were were eyeing each other out and trying to um 
you know, just get one edge over the other. But nothing, from Michelle's point of view, nothing was sticking like it has been in, in, in other games I've seen them. In fairness to UCD, they were well drilled and well positioned. And I wouldn't say they, I wouldn't go as far as to say that they parked the bus, but they were very well organised. And it only took then into the second half. Uh, I think Duffer let roar at them at half time. And then um, the the performance slight, was slightly better, but it wasn't until uh, I think it was Jack Moylan was felled in the box and Jack Keeney got the red card that then um, Sean Boyd obviously scored the penalty. But I just feel as though uh, shells were really um, lacklustre. As Sean Boyd said it in the interview after the game as well. I was uh, helping out doing the media for shells uh, with him and Duffer. Both both of them were, were really annoyed with how they'd played. And Dan Carr, I just think, was just delighted to get the late goal. But like in fairness to UCD, when they went to 10 men, they were still having a go. And um, I still think they're going to prove tricky for any team this season, despite losing Liam Kerrigan and Colin Whelan being out injured. Um, they are very well um, organised. And I think Andy Moyler, in fairness to his credit, I know he's come out and he's been very, very annoyed with the way things have gone uh, this season. Penalties given award, uh, against him and stuff like that. But I do think that he, he'll go on to, to be a good manager at some club because I just think with what he's working at UCD, and um, he's still doing quite well. Look, I know it's a 2-0 loss and Chelsea didn't play well, but in fairness to UCD, I think if, if Jack Keeney stays on, they, they probably would have nicked a point there. Yeah, and I think uh, Finn Hops are getting very worried about UCD at the moment. Uh, it, it was, and they they had gone down to the showgrounds and deservedly beat Sligo Rovers 2-0. And uh, so... I agree Andy Myler's done a great job. A few of us, including myself, I suppose, had probably written them off a, a few weeks ago, and they probably still are favourites to go straight back down. But they are making Harps nervous. There, there's very little in it. There's, I think it's just goal difference at the moment. I see their rearranged game against Strahad is on Easter Monday. Sorry, no, Bank Holiday Monday in August. And uh, it's... Yeah, Harps are on a bad run, so UCD could maybe sneak into the playoffs. And, well, nobody gave them much chance in the playoffs last season, and, and we know what happened there. So, uh, yeah, I, I think Andy Myler has done a great job, and they, they're in with a shout. Um, you mentioned Finn Harps. I I got both sides of that game in Dundalk, and uh, they both seem to think that 3-0 was not a fair result, that it should have been more. So, um Harps are on a bad run, and, and, and there's even, which I, I'm actually shocked at, some Harps fans talking about Oli Horgan out. No, I think that would be a major mistake for them. I think he's done an incredible job there, and I think he, he will turn it around. But they are getting a bit nervous about UCD and feeling the pressure. And uh, I think the injury to David Webster hasn't helped. I think he's a vital um yeah. player for them you know at the back and I think he, he's helped him over the line of victories just his experience and he's a quality player as well so I think they are really missing him he's been out injured for a long time now I think he'll be out till the end of the season if I'm not mistaken well I agree and he he was look a massive experienced player very calm head at the back a real great organiser and everything I agree he's a massive loss but I'm sure any UCD fan is going to say, hang on a second, they've lost Colin Whelan for the season and uh, one of the best strikers in the league. Talking about a need for Shamrock Rovers, well, there's your answer. And uh, if he gets back fully fit and firing, uh, and Liam Kerrigan as well. So I, I don't think any UCD fans will have too much sympathy for Finn Harps, but it is a good point because he is a massive loss. Yeah, no, I totally agree um, with that. I just think that Webster has just been such a key player for them over the um, the course of his, his reign there. Um, he's been brilliant, and I think he was one of the reasons why they've done so well in the last couple of seasons. Um, just on uh, on, on Shamrock Rovers and Drogheda, like, Drogheda seemed to be Shamrock Rovers' bogey team. Actually, actually I'm going to go talk about Shells first because I think um, it, it's kind of gone a bit unnoticed the job Damien Duff has done has been brilliant because you look at where Shells were about 10 games ago they were looking over their shoulder at the likes of Drogheda and Finn Harps and so on now Shells are sitting in 7th with a game in hand on Pats and 4th and they're only 5 points behind them and they have a game in hand on Drogheda 
and they're five five points ahead of Drada. So Shells are in a really good position now where I can confidently say that they'll stay up. But they're in a position now where they can start looking above and saying, right, well, Bowes have lost players, Sligo have bought, lost players, and they're in Europe. Um, so it could be a chance to to start gaining some points there and, and doing so well. Now, I know it's the, the Cup this week, but I definitely think Shells are, are well within a chance of looking at that fourth spot as a as an attainable um, goal to, to go get. Yeah, well, I think virtually every season in recent years, fourth has been a European spot. Obviously, it depends on somebody above winning the Cup. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility, I suppose, of Shell's doing it. Uh, you mentioned Drogheda. I don't think I, I agree. Shells are safe from relegation, but I don't think Drogheda have any relegation worries either. And uh, maybe just a little bit far back, I think Drogheda will, will comfortably finish in eighth position, comfortably stay up, but not challenge for Europe. It might be a bit of a stretch. I think Shells' game in hand is against Shamrock Rovers, so catching Pats and also catching Bows and Sligo Rovers might be just that little bit too much. But you know, as you say. It, it, it's there, it's attainable, and there's also the possibility of a cup run as well. And a tricky tie for shells out in the Carlisle grounds, but um, who knows? I, I agree that things have improved considerably, and uh, there's still a lot to play for for shells for this season. Yeah, no, I, t- I, I agree, and I think shells, if they can do well in the cup as well, be another good avenue to kind of go down as well and uh, to have a good season with. But I think shells. Strangely enough, they, they they can beat anybody in the league on the day. It's just whether all the players are firing, you know. Although Bowes seems to be Shell's bogey team this season, but yeah, we'll move on to uh, speaking of bogey teams, Drogheda and uh, and Shamrock Rovers. Disappointing result probably for Shamrock Rovers, but considering the week that they had, it probably wasn't. I think they they'd been happy just to avoid defeat there and uh, avoid any sort of banana skins. They probably thought they were going to win the game with the score, the first goal. But in fairness, Evan Weir. He's uh he's he's really building a, a nice reputation for himself now. I know he got sent a red card in the end, but he obviously scored the goal and people are talking about him. And I remember at the start of the season actually uh, Dane Massey raving about him, saying if there was one player to watch out for this season, it's uh Evan Weir at left back, which is funny because that's obviously Dane's position or was Dane's position. Yeah, I mean actually not just Evan Weir, draw to have been probably under the radar, but in many ways one of the stories of the season because of their look. They're on a very limited budget. They lost their manager. They lost their best players. And uh, they've still managed to turn it around. And, I mean, they're comfortably ahead. Maybe the Drogheda fans are still looking over their shoulders. But it's really, really tough to see one of Finn Harps or UCD actually catching them and dragging Drogheda back into this relegation battle. They have a nice little cushion. Pretty soon we're going to start running out of games, and the other key thing is Drogheda are still picking up points, and that was a, that was a superb point, and it showed great character to go behind so late in Tala, having played so well. I mean, I was talking to a Shamrock Rovers fan who was there, and he reckoned Drogheda fully deserved the point. He thought Rovers had nicked it when they got the late goal, but then Drogheda to come back, show the character, come back and equalise, and it was a far better point for Drogheda than it was for Shamrock Rovers. And uh, yeah, I'd seen Evan Weir with UCD, and he really impressed me. And uh, it's no surprise that he's doing well in Drogheda as well. Yeah, well, I think yeah, as you said, I think Drogheda will be safe, and I think it's will come down to UCD and Finn Harps. Um, Shamrock Rovers, on the other hand, I think their their priority right now is Europe, and I don't think they'd be looking at too much else. I mean, they they have a good enough squad to be able to compete in both the league and and Europe, and they obviously will have. Uh, targeted that at the start of the season when when they were recruiting players now i know they didn't recruit that many but now uh it'll be interesting to see if they recruit any more by the time the summer's over and if they're getting money and and stuff like that and uh, before the transfer window closes it'd be interesting to see who they get in as well um that could maybe help them kick in i think jack Ro- jack burns sorry jack rovers i know you call them jack burn um is still to come back from injury and stuff like that and when he comes back he'll be like a new signing for them too so don't forget him in there. Uh, Graham Burke still has to come back to full fitness. So they still have quality players there. I think Rory Gaffney's been unreal this season, to be fair to him. Um, I did see a video of him punching someone uh, 
I think it was Chris Lyons on um, online there yesterday on Twitter during the game. I think people were calling for a retrospective ban. Um, I haven't watched it back. It looks like he clocks him. Um, Chris Lyons it was, yeah. As you've probably seen that clip online. If uh, if you haven't, go check it. I don't know who it was, but if, I'm sure if you type in Rory Gaffney on Twitter, you'll, you'll find the the clip. But uh, I'm not ratting on him. I'm just saying that... Uh, <laughs> He probably should have been sent off if, if you watched the video. But look, uh, Shamrock Rovers are motoring on. Um, still not a, not a, it might be two points dropped, but it's certainly a point in the right direction for them. And uh, they'll, I still think they'll, they'll go on to win the league, in my opinion. Um, I just think they have the edge. Let's move on to the first division. And um, <clears throat> Cork City 1 0 win over Wexford. Uh, Keane Murphy with the goal. And. Um, Mitchell Byrne then getting red card in the 90th minute as well in that game. Um, Galway won 3 1 against Atlone away from home. Andrew Spain, any relation to you? He scored for Atlone. No, he, I'm afraid not. <laughs> no. Uh, Galway United, uh, goal scorers Robert Manley, um, Manuel Arbello, and Franceli Lombato in the 90th. Two goals in the 90th minute actually to win it very late. That was a very dramatic game. Uh, a red card for Aaron Connolly, not the Aaron Connolly you're thinking of, but if you are thinking of him, I did do a podcast with him during the week, so make sure to go check that out as well. Um, then uh, Cove beat Bray 3-1. Curtis Byrne with the goal for Bray. And then Conor McManus, Jason Abbott, Dara O'Sullivan, Connell with the 87-minute goal. And then Waterford and uh, Longford played, and Longford beat Waterford 2-0. Shane Griffin getting the goal. And then, oh, two late goals then. Jordan Adiemo and Sam Verdon. Late goals to win it for Longford away from home. There was a red card in that game then for Wasim Aoucheria. I hope I said that right, but that's how it looked. Um, no game for Treaty this week. I imagine they were idle. Um, so, yeah, um, that is the crack. Then, obviously, the table. Cork are sitting pretty in first with uh, 53 points with a game in hand on Galway who are a point behind them then there's a bit of a gap then it's uh, Waterford with uh, 41 points in 20, uh, 22 played um, Longford have a game in hand on or sorry they have a game in hand on, on Longford and then Treaty are just under Longford three points off them with the same amount of games played Wexford underneath them um, three points ahead uh, Treaty are three points ahead of Wexford and then it's a bit of a gap again then uh, Bray on 21 points Cove on 12 points and Athlone on eight points. So that is the story with the first division. Cork looking like they're uh, they're going to start going on a bit of a run now. And I think they are the strongest team in the division. But I wouldn't write Galway off just yet. And um, definitely you have Treaty and the likes um, aiming for those playoff positions. I haven't done so well last year to get into the playoffs as well. Yeah, I, actually Cork and, and Galway both showed great character to win uh, on Friday night. Cork really had to dig that out. Wexford are actually in great form. That was the first defeat for a while. And uh, I know Cork were absolutely delighted to hear the final whistle. That was a hard fought, but very important three points. Galway, as you mentioned, I mean, to be winning for so long, to concede such a late equaliser would have been a real kick in the teeth with Cork winning. But then to go back up the other end and score, a score twice actually in added time or whatever to win the game. Uh, as you said, Cork are, they have the advantage. They have a game in hand as well, but I, I would, I'd never write off a of John Caulfield side and Galway are going to push them all the way. Waterford, they're in the playoffs. They, they were, I, I believe, Bitterly, bitterly disappointed with the refereeing on Friday night. Um, I didn't see any of it, so I can't comment, but there were comments all over social media. It is between Longford Treaty and Wexford, I believe, for the last two playoff places. Longford have been dragged back into the battle a little bit. They had been a bit of a bad run. Uh, Bray, I, I think, it was a very disappointing defeat for them in Cove. And a great win for Shane Keegan, actually, in the first start. And, and hats off to Cove as well. They've reached the Munster Cup final as well. They beat Rockmount during the week. And a uh, nice little local derby for them, not just in the FEI Cup, now in the Munster Cup final. So My allegiance is live at Rockmount. I haven't worked down in uh, North Cork. <laughs> um, I was told that I wasn't allowed to support anybody else outside of Cork. Yeah, Roy, Roy Keane's old club, of course. But, That's right, um, yeah. 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 Um, 
But yeah, it's great for Ramblers to a couple of massive games for them. Their season might be over from a league perspective, but I'm sure they'd love to get one over in Cork City in the FEI Cup and in the Munster Cup final. So best to look to Shane Keegan in those ones anyway. And uh, at loan, even though they're rock bottom of the league, they're still causing problems and very nearly uh, damaged Galway's promotion hopes on, on Friday night. So there's a lot to play for still in the first division and uh, some interesting battles ahead. And great attendances as well. Like just we just want to make sure that we touch on that as well. Like Cork and and that um still bringing in a really big crowd and I think they'll be a great asset uh, if they get back up to the Premier Division now next season. I think you know they've been missed. Um, I do like the away day down in Cork. Um, I do like getting down, like even doing the Presidents Cup when they were doing well. It was great. Um, they really do get behind their their club and they really do love it. And um. Yeah, it'd be nice now to, to get a couple of clubs outside of Dublin coming up. It's great to get the games in Dublin and so on, but I like I like the the other trips, the trips down to Cork. And I have a lot of friends down now in Cork, so I'm actually hoping they come up so I can go down and visit them and, and hopefully bring some friends to some League of Ireland games. Maybe they're not League of Ireland fans, but get them into it that way, you know. Um, same, I'd love to start going up to Derry games and stuff like that. Galway games if they get up. Limerick games, Treaty um or so on so forth you know it'd be nice to get a couple of clubs waterford as well missed uh in the premier division as well so um yeah it will be it'll be an interesting end of season i think we'll wrap it up there for our league of ireland show we've been on long enough um uh yeah uh let us know your thoughts on anything we discussed um in the comments and uh we'll speak to you all soon don't forget to like the video don't forget to subscribe and check out all of our other content and if you want to follow any of our other socials, you can in the comments. Uh, we'll speak to you soon. Thanks very much for watching. Take care and God bless. Thanks, guys.